How often do you think about ungulates? I do every day. Hi all, I desperately want to be a bird, and this is Ground Up History. Today, I want to start with a vibe. Imagine yourself in ancient Iraq, on a prosperous farm at the edge of the Tigris or Euphrates. You have comfort here, home and family, but what lies before you is an endless windswept desert with hills rolling into looming mountains. What's on the other side? Not all people are cut out to leave their world behind and risk everything to explore unknown lands. But maybe there's some spark in you, so curious no fear can douse the desire to explore. Would you set out to find new lands, trade for exotic wares, learn new languages, faiths, and technologies? Do you have what it takes to be the first one to set foot in a hostile land, brave its dangers, and live to tell the tale? Well, maybe you don't have to go it alone. See, way back, like way, way back in the 10,000 BCs, we domesticated sheep and goats. And not only were they edible, they produce milk, you can get hides from them, or wool, all of which provide shelter and comfort. And best of all, they eat the floor. So you can basically go anywhere where there's grass now and have a mobile means of food, production, and clothing wherever you want. And that management is what makes the phenomenon of domesticating these animals so interesting. Because for most of human history, we would follow migratory large herding animals. We just weren't in control of where they went. Like, say for example, you were in the Arctic Circle hunting big snow goats, like muskox. Well, you would still have all of those things, except maybe the milk. But you basically were at the behest of that beast. I mean, yes, they're adorable, but they're also not particularly smart. No matter where you were, if you were hunting scaredy sheep, Santa goats, or large ungulate, you were entirely dependent on where that animal went. Whereas now, with the advent of herding, you controlled the destiny of those creatures. So if you wanted to move between major urban centers, you could just drive your herd there, trade for them with all of the local goods they can produce, and then bring that all the way to somewhere else it completely changes the game of that nomadic lifestyle. So let's go back to that farm in Iraq. Now you're settled, you've got wheat, but hey, you don't own the land. Some guy says he owns the land and he makes you pay taxes. And if you point out how much that sucks, he just kills you. I love the kind of woman that will actually just kill me. That hardly seems fair. Isn't there a better way? Well, if you feel like you desire freedom more than comfort, you have a kinship with the herders, my friend. I mean, okay, yeah, in, in fairness, not everybody who herded sheep and goats didn't keep the sedentary lifestyle in the house and still remained entirely dependent on the landlord. But for the peoples that did move away and travel into places like the Eurasian steppe, herding of goats and sheep facilitated a new lifestyle, which I would argue is of vital and often underestimated importance. See, for most of human history, trade has been conducted via waterways. The Nile River, Yangtze, Mississippi River, the Mediterranean, the Straits of Malacca. I mean, you can just list anywhere of geographical significance that water flows, and we've probably traded along it. Even in the modern day, about 80% of global trade is conducted via water. I mean, remember that time that a boat got stuck in the Suez Canal and everybody lost like billions of dollars every day? So how is it that you conduct trade then over land if even in our modern day with planes, trains, and automobiles, it's still more profitable to do it by water? How did something like the Silk Road come to exist so profitably if there were easier alternatives by boat? I would argue that goats and sheep play a pretty significant role in that development, and as a result, one of the most important geopolitical systems of history. Okay, and yeah, I should probably address the giant neighing elephant in the room. Obviously, horses were vital to this lifestyle as well, and the development of the Silk Road. I mean, I bet when most people think of Mongols, if they think of Mongols at all, they probably think of a horse archer. But maybe we should spend a little more time thinking about that Mongol's family that was herding a bunch of goats right behind him. See, that Mongol army still needs to eat. And for all of these regions, these vast disparate plains that humans migrated across, whether that be 
East Africa with the Bantu migrations, or when people migrated up into the Andes, or across the entirety of the Eurasian steppe. Most of those migrations actually happened before we domesticated horses. See, work animals that we would eat, like goats and sheep, as previously mentioned, or even cattle and oxen, were all domesticated around 10,000 years ago. Whereas horses and camels weren't domesticated until around probably 3,500 to maybe 3,000 BC. So there's a pretty big gap in time there. And of the Indo-European migrations, probably one of the most consequential events of Eurasian history, all of those migrations occurred from Central Asia before they had domesticated horses and before they'd even started using chariots. So the first waves of people that settled empires like the Hittites or started the Mauryan Empire in India or the Persians, all of these huge consequential moments in that past started and began with a spread of peoples facilitated not by their mounted mastery of the horse, but by their simple mastery of the pasture. Even those great Turco-Mongol warriors who would harass Han China into building probably the dumbest wall ever. I mean, it's cool, but like, it's very expensive. Uh, those people still depended on goats and sheep to live. The Zulu warriors of Shaka were a cattle culture. They depended on the same cattle that the Bantu migrants had reached there with. And for the great Incan Empire? Yeah, living high up is hard when you don't have the wool of a llama or an alpaca. And it's probably even harder to walk that entire mountain highway of trade routes without having an alpaca that's at least willing to carry a little bit of the weight. So for things like the Silk Road to develop, you needed to basically have a population center that could be transited between. And that population existed in the region not because of the preeminence of the horse, but because of goats and sheep. See, sure, if you were transiting goods, it was useful to have a caravan of camels and horses, and it was good to have a group of Mongol archers to guard you. But you weren't going to make that journey if you didn't have anything to eat along the way. And that's true of all of these places. If you look at the Inca in the Andes, that's a harsh terrain of high mountains that, yeah, they farmed, and it was amazing what they were able to achieve, but I find it difficult to believe they could have done it without alpacas and llamas. Or Shaka Zulu building an empire in an arid, hard-to-farm region in southern Africa probably wouldn't have been possible without the advent of cattle. And even Genghis Khan, for all his brilliance and untold violence, probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere if he didn't have something to eat. All of that to say, imagine if the Eurasian steppe was too barren to be able to brave, or if the Andes were too harsh to climb, or if the Bantu weren't able to migrate across East Africa. In all of these cases, these animals allowed us to chart our own path over land, and resultantly have affected our world in untold ways. All right, and with that, I'm gonna end off here. Thank you for watching the video, like and subscribe, and thank you to New Zealand for recognizing the majesty of sheep. You want freedom? Here you go. There she goes.